We've been talking about resetting and resetting, trying to get back on track in 2021. What year is this? 2021. And uh, trying to get back on track. Remember, I, I'm encouraging different steps. Step one, I think, is to stay focused. Remember your purpose in life, which, of course, is all about him. Purpose in life is not to save up for retirement. Purpose in life is not to be famous. Purpose in life is not to be rich. Fam purpose in life is not to have a bunch of kids. That's not our purpose in life. Jesus never, he gave us a very particular job description, that is, to do what God wants and then to make disciples of Jesus. And so he wants to use you, wherever you're at in any circumstance, to do that very thing. Students, moms, dads, ex-spouses, it doesn't matter what your role or what your position is, wherever you are right now, he wants to use you in that position. And that's amazing. And we trust the process, we have self-control and do the Christian habits that will help us grow up to be just like him. Step three, of course, is letting go and heal, letting go of the need to control, letting go of the past that might back bog us down, our need to control other people, other circumstances, and then healing from that. Step four was last week, that it's time to grow up, hunger for more. How many of you this week even thought about, if those who heard the sermon thought about just using those categories, infant Christian, teenage Christian, adult Christian, do you ever think about this week at all? Good. Uh, did, did you hopefully spend some time in prayer thinking about, God, where am I at? And that category where I'm at, some, someone this week said, David, I'm a little confused because I, I'm a little bit in categories in both. And I think that's fine because, you know, I, there's no Bible verse that says here's how exactly it works out. But it's good to think about. They were, they were taking it very seriously. Like, I want to get to the next level. I want to grow up. And I'm like, praise God. So how can I help? It was a good conversation. So wherever you might be, that's, that's where we start. That's where we start. We don't get discouraged by that. We say, that's where I'm at. Uh, last week out of the sermon, one wife looked at me and she said, oh, he's, a t he's, a t he's, a, he's, a, he's an infant. I'm a teenager. I said, don't listen to her. It's pretty funny. I laughed a lot. I said, maybe, he's, maybe she's right, man. Don't listen to her. She knows what you're talking about. She says, I'm a teenager. He's an infant. So I don't know where you're at. I'm not in the business of telling people where they're at, but it's good for us all to realize maybe where we're at and figure out how to grow up. Step five, and this is the last one for this sermon series. We're going to change gear next week. Step five, we could talk about, of course, anything, but when I was thinking about praying about things to really cover, I think maybe it's on track. Step five might seem a little simple for you, but I think it's a very powerful step and getting reset to be a disciple of Jesus. And that is, will you read this with me, if you can read aloud? Choose to be thankful. Now, we can say grateful, that's fine too, but thankful and grateful are similar. I'll talk about that. I think it's very important. Now, right off the bat, something that's very important to understand that a lot of people might not grasp, that is, we tend to think we're constant victims of our own beliefs and thoughts and attitudes and behavior. We tend to think it's just, it's happening to me. We tend to play the victim. Please understand People can be legitimate victims. I'm not talking about legitimate victims. I'm saying that's, that's different. People have been hurt, been spouse walks out on you, or I get hit by a car, uh, we get cancer. I mean, things happen to us. I'm not talking about that. That's legitimate victimhood. Uh, we have a reason to be sad and grieve about that. I'm talking about what we have what we call in psychology, playing the victim. When you're not really one, you're pretending to be one. And we all tend to do that. That's the human predicament. We tend to do that. We tend to say, whatever I'm thinking or feeling or doing, it's not really my fault. We're not victims, but we pretend to be. A lot of times, I'm not going off a long list, and the counselors come do the same thing. I'm sure Sam come up here and say, there's a lot of reasons why we tend to do this because we don't want to avoid responsibility. We're trying to avoid negative feelings, blah, blah, blah. But we tend to do that. But it's very important to understand because when I say the words, choose to be thankful, choose to be grateful, some of you right now might be already kind of written me off to say, well, not really, David, because, I mean, you can't always be thankful all the time, right? That's part of that victim me mentality. But we're not victims to that. We're really not. We're not victims of that. In general, we're not. In general, we're not. As a mindset, as an attitude, we're not. So, for example, the old, 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 uh, hold on, let me go back. My fault, too fast. The old, you know, glass. So is this glass half what? Well, a bunch of, bunch of optimists. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> Empty. So the pastor's looking for both. Good, that's right. <laughs> you know, if you think about it for a second, this whole thing is a half empty, half full. It does say a lot about people. What you see, it does say a lot about your general disposition. It does. It does. And the fact is, and you can do studies on this, the fact is, if you're accustomed to having a glass that's full, you'll see this is half empty. If you're used to seeing glass that's empty, you're going to see this is half full. It's called the scarcity principle. It's one reason why I get people to buy you things in marketing. It's a very big thing. You have to make you feel like you're almost out. We're almost out. Got to buy the last perfume. <laughs> I'll get it. They're lying. It's a very common trick. You lie. Oh, well, let me see if there's any left. You, you get scarcity principle. And we tend to do that. We tend to, if we grow up, you grew up in environments where you didn't have much water, and you see that, you go, whoo, man, I'm thirsty. That looks good. But if you're used to having water all the time, you go, well, it's half empty, man. Where's the rest of it? We assume there's more to it. 
But the fact is, we do all do it. We all come to this kind of idea in life. We choose to think a certain way. And I want you to reflect on that the rest of the sermon. We come there. We choose it. Now, just a little nerd talk. When we talk about being thankful, being grateful, thank is, rem- is a similar to our old, old English word for think, and so they're similar. To thank means to think positively about. That's what it means. So I thank you uh, means I think positively about you. Grateful is a weird English word. It's, it's almost unique, almost, where it's two, two adjectives stuck together. An, old in- an adjective we don't use anymore, probably great is probably how they pronounced it from the Latin. It means to grieve, and they put the word full on it as well, so it's adjective and adjective stuck together. Uh, so grateful means something like to be, ple- I'm, I am agreeable. I'm, a, I'm usually thankfulness is a belief about gratitude is usually doing something about it. Usually, not always. And the New Testament, though, in your English translation, typically you'll see thankfulness or gratitude, gratefulness, usually translate, usually one word or a root word. Uh, of course, karitayo or karis. And so karis is the word we use for grace. When you turn to a verb or the ethos of the end, the I don't know if you can read Greek. You know, katitos, the very last etos, looks like I-T-O-S. And when you turn it into an adjective, it's like kindness or gratitude. It shows up 402 times. I say it's a lot. So it's a basic concept throughout the New Testament, this concept of to show kindness to or to be gra- grateful about. It's a basic belief in Christianity that Christians have a disposition of being grateful, being thankful. It's actually a, a moral imperative of the Christian. It's one of the things that demarcates oftentimes a disciple of Jesus from a non-disciple of Jesus, a non-Christian. Now, let's turn to Luke 17, 11, and let's look at one example of of what it means to be grateful. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Luke 17. If you don't have a Bible, there's some by the lamps. Look, I'm jumping on top, Bible by the lamps. You have a Bible app. Please take the time to look up a Bible, Bible app. It's really important. Matthew, Mark, Luke, so it's this third gospel on the right side of your Bible. Luke 17, Luke 17, and we'll start in verse 11. Be sure to look in the text. Do you have it? Will you say amen? Good, be sure to look. It's very important. So in this context, uh, Jesus is going through, to be real general here, he's talking, he's on his way to Jerusalem giving lessons, we might say, on discipleship. But this is a unique story to Luke, and listen to what Luke gives us. Only in Luke is this story of all the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, and John don't have this story. Jesus says this, uh, well, Luke says this. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. Now I was going to show you a map. If you think for a second, if, uh, if you're going north, like the cup, imagine this glass uh, is Israel. Samaria, Galilee is up north. Samaria is right beneath it. It's a big section in the middle. So the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. Uh, and I've talked about this before, but they didn't get along well. They didn't necessarily hate each other, but they could have, I mean, they didn't like each other usually because they disagreed on um, theology, basically. They had a little different Bible, a little different. They worshipped at another place called Mount Gerizim, the Samaritans did, where the Jews worshipped in Jerusalem at the temple. So a lot of religious disagreements, and uh, they had battles throughout the history, so they did not get along, and that will matter to the story. So he's passing between Samaria and Galilee, and those, those regions are right beside each other, um, like you know Kiwani and whatever nearby, or you know, Nepons. And as he entered a village... He goes near a village. He was met by 10 lepers, lepers who stood at a distance. Now, the, the Greek word actually for leper or leprosy, your, did your translation say lepers? That, that's fine, leprosy? Sometimes it says skin disease. Uh, actually, we're not exactly sure if leprosy was a disease in this region in this century. So, but the translation is stuck, and so people always say lepers. The, the term actually can be used for any number of skin diseases. So we're not actually sure they were technically lepers, if that matters to you, that, but... It'll always stick because the King James Version put it as lepers, and I'll probably just, that's the most dominant influence of our translations, unfortunately. So these, these 10 guys with skin diseases, if you're a Jew in the time period, or even a Samaritan, if you're a Jew or a Samaritan in the time period and you have a skin disease, you cannot go to the temple. You have, um, you're ritually impure. Think of it, it's not exactly the same, but stay with me. It's like having covid so if when you have COVID, you're supposed to sequester yourself. If you have it, say you travel overseas, say you've got to you know, quarantine yourself for two weeks. You can't, do, you can't go to the store. You can't whatever it might be. If you had a skin disease of any nature, and there's all kinds of things that would cause this, all kinds of things in the ancient world and Judaism that would cause this, that you were supposed to quarantine yourself, and one is a skin disease. And so you were supposed to stay away from people because it could spread. Your ritual impurity could spread to them. If you were near a corpse, if a woman had a baby, if a woman's menstruating, there's tons of things that would mean, oh, now you've got to quarantine. 
Now you've got to quarantine, and there's a time limit. And once the quarantine's over, then you can go back to the temple. And then a priest would then render, yeah, your time's up. That, yep, yeah, you've done, you've been quarantined well enough, that's good. So the fact that they're at, a, they're at a village, they're near a village, and they're still at a distance is perfect for the time context because they're together because they all got it. So they're all quarantined together, and they're staying away from people. But they're not that far from people. They're not way on the desert because they've got to beg for money because they can't keep a job. And so they come up and they see Jesus, and they lift their voices, and they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, which, of course, just means heal us. So they recognize who Jesus is, and when he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. So right away, this is one of the few miracles in the entire New Testament where Jesus heals a person at a distance. Go, go to show yourself to the priest. That means on your way to the priest, the assumption is, as you go up toward either the Mount Gadazim if they're Samaritans or Jerusalem if they're Jews, you'll be healed on your way. I took care of that. So they're healed. Uh, their, their body is healed. And as they went, they were cleansed. So they were cleansed. That means, of course, they got healed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. So he's praying, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. I've been healed. Oh, Lord Jesus, you did it. Thank you. Thank you. So he realizes that Jesus is the conduit, you might say, through God the Father. And he's praising God at Jesus' feet because of what's happened. And then Luke drops the bomb. Now he was a what? Samaritan. That's when the Jews in the audience go, ugh. We don't want the Samaritans to get it right. He's a Samaritan. Now the implication probably is, maybe not, that the other ones were Jews. So the Samaritan is the one who recognized that God had worked through Jesus. Then Jesus says, good, good hyperbole, good, uh, uh, good rhetorical device, weren't there ten? Weren't there ten? Hmm, where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Where are the fellow Jews? Don't they recognize God at work when they see God at work? Why does the Samaritan see it? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith, literally is, has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Now, there's two ways to look at that, at least two major ways, and my mind's not fully made up yet after all my reading research through the years. One way is to say that this second time, this guy finally gets saved. That is to say, he becomes a disciple of Jesus. He recognizes God the Father has worked through Jesus. He recognizes who Jesus is. That saved him. The others were just healed. But this one's been, he's been healed and saved. That's one, that's one reading. The other reading is that they were all just healed. But Jesus' point is, what does it take for these people to recognize I'm, that God, I'm working God's activities, that the kingdom of God is through me? So is the condemnation, it, no matter what, it's still condemnation. Where is everybody else? Where's everybody else? Why does it, what would it take for people to see God at work? You would think a skin disease as you're running back to the priest would be the sign that God's doing something in your life. Is it hard for you to see God at work? Do you recognize God in your life? I mean, think about that for a second. Really think about that. Do you really gut level recognize how good God has been to you? It sure is hard to be grateful and thankful to God when we don't give him credit for things that he's done. Now, some people in this room, some people watching online, just in general aren't very thankful people. They're not. I always remember this guy I took to coffee, took to breakfast one time, and um, he, we were, he's a little socially awkward, and that's okay, but I mean, I expected some of that. Uh, but we were having breakfast, you know, you know, my treat, cool, and we're doing, a, I'm, and I'm going back to get a refill of coffee. And as I stood up to go get some coffee, I said, I'll be right back, get some coffee. And he goes, David, and he threw his coffee cup at me and shook it. I looked at him, and I start giggling like he's a kid. Like he's going to say, hey, man, would you please? And he stares at me and keeps shaking it. And I go, would you like a refill? Decaf. Shut up. I said, okay. Huh? Decaf? Is that what you want? No, that's not what I, he almost said, no, I don't do decaf. So anyway, I go, okay, I'd be happy to get that for you. So I get it, get him his refill, get my refill, and I come back, give it to him. Of course, he doesn't say a word. I just remind me that after I thought I was raised in an environment where you always said what? Thank you. You always said please and thank you. You always said please give me something. Some people aren't raised that way. And I get it. I get it. Some people don't have the heart and mind to do that. I get it. And sometimes that just spills over to God, right? In general, you're just not a grateful person. You just expect people to take care of you all the time. It doesn't, it doesn't occur to you to say thank you all the time. It does me. Some people do the same thing. They just take it to God. So when it's time to praise God in song, 
And praise God, it's like, I don't want to sing God. He's so good, he's glorious, who cares? I mean, psh. Psh. God, you provided all my needs. I mean, not really. I'm the one that worked hard, if you think about it, David. I'm the one that goes to work. I'm the one that worked hard. I went to school. I learned the skill set. It's very difficult, if that's your mindset, to realize that God's been good to you. I mean, don't you realize the job you have is because God gave you one? The skill set you have is because God gave you the skill set? Your capacity to learn that information to get the job done came from God. That capacity came from God. The healthy relationships you're forming with people, those come from God. He's interacted. He's, he's made these kind of divine appointments in your life for that season in your life. Do you recognize how good God has been to you? Or is that really hard for you? Are you the kind of person who's going to God or in life just shaking the coffee cup? See, the Christian imperative is that we don't know that way. We say God is so good all the time, all the time. God is We'll do that again. You haven't heard that. You haven't grown. Mature. God is good all the time, all the time. All the time God is good. All the time. All the time. So like the leper, we come back and say, thank you, God. Now, Paul says something similar but a little different to the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So this is farther in your right side of your Bible. Farther, farther in the right side of the Bible. 1 Thessalonians. Paul's writing to a church. This might be the early, this or Galatians is Paul's very first document for which we have record. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, he, he, hits, he hits several different, um, we call them um, moral exhortations. He's, he's saying do this, do this, do this. He's sitting several of them back to back. And this is real some short Bible verses to memorize for this week if you wanted to memorize anything. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, 17, and 18. Do you have it? Amen? Paul says, Rejoice sometimes, pray when you can, and give thanks most of the time. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Is that what your translation says? False? Doesn't say that, does he? I'll do this again. Rejoice when? Always. Christians? Pray how long? Continually, constantly, and give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God wants you to do these things. Now, notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, verse 18, give thanks for all circumstances that's not what paul said david how in the world can the jews at auschwitz be thankful for that david how can i be thankful my spouse walked out on me how can i be thankful that person died how can i be th he didn't say be thankful for everything he said be thankful in all things in all circumstances no matter what we are thankful to god for what god has done and what he's doing in all circumstances that can be very difficult to do it's easier when you're a leper or some person with a skin disease who's clearly seen the visible sign. They prayed out to God. It's almost like a prayer because God, please help me. Jesus, please help me. Boom, the prayer was answered. Woo, immediate. Man, it sure is easier to praise God when that happens. Not if you have a disposition of, I don't really care, whatever. I mean, I guess I prayed. I guess he did it. But if you really know, realize that come from God, God's been good. Woohoo! It's another time when it's difficult in the circumstances to see what's going on. To say, where is he at? It didn't, I didn't get the immediate healing for that. So sometimes it's difficult. Do you have a difficult time seeing, finding things for which to be thankful? If that's you, you're not alone. Uh, before I worked here, I was, it took a long time. I, I, I had talked on and off to multiple churches. It took a long time to find, a, uh, to, to find the right church. And I'm still looking, so pray for me. And I, I, I'm kidding, just joking, just joking. I'm so glad that I'm here, so glad. My family's glad. Whether you're glad or not, I'm glad that I'm here. And, um, but... It was some real, 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 real dark times for that year and a half. I mean, real dark times, now, especially for Elaine. I mean, it was some real dark. It, I can go for a long time, and maybe every time if you want to hear it. But there was some times in my life I'd wake up, I mean, every single day trying to practice what I preach and go, Lord, I'm trying to be thankful. I've lost almost everything. I have, I mean, when you're out of a job, not to, not only time, but it's just a job. It's also ministry. I mean, the whole sense of, am I, are you done with me? Am I out of ministry? Do I need to go and other careers I had ideas for, whatever, or my, I mean, I, it was difficult. And so many, many times, okay, God, what's some basic things I'm thankful for? And I did. I go back to brass tacks. I'm thankful you're real. I'm thankful you're raised from the dead. I'm thankful that you've brought me this far. I'm thankful for a roof over my head. It's not my roof. It's someone else's roof. At least I get to live here. I'm thankful for a bed to wake up in. I'm thankful for your forgiveness. I'm thankful for a family. I'm, th I'm just thankful. For just, I'm glad I got shoes to wear, man. I'm so thankful I had a pillow. I'm just so thankful. So thankful. Sometimes it can be very, very difficult to find things for which to be thankful. This video reminds me of that in a second. We'll talk about that. 
And when we get accustomed to things, like I, I'm used to having a job, I'm used to having these things, man, we just get complaining, right? When we're accustomed to finding, we get what I want, we're just, we're difficult to please. I've noticed that a lot when you go to talk to people who are very poor, ask them, how do you do it? How do you live without an Xbox to some Haitian kid? Go to Canaan Christian Community and ask them, how do you live without cable? <laughs> how do you make it? Reminds me of that song. There's a song popular a while years ago that said, I lost my keys. She's talking about like a bad day. And she's going, oh, it's this blessing. I just, I lost my keys. I'm late for work. She just, all these things. I always picture this song. It's a popular Christian tune. It was on the radio for a long time. I always picture her singing that on a stage full of starving Africans or starving Americans. And she's going, I lost my keys. You know what I mean. <laughs> it's been a rough day. Oh, God, help me see. You know what I'm talking about. You know when your car won't start. Oh, my goodness. And they're staring at her. When we're accustomed to get what we want, when we're accustomed to the water being full all the time and it goes empty, man, we're hard to please. We're hard to please. We become entitled. We become entitled. And we expect things to happen our way. to get where we want we get entitled the ancient israelites were the similar way and i understand that. oh i think i'd said a similar thing but when they went to all they gone through wandering through the wilderness after they've been set free from god from exodus uh, in their egypt to the exodus account they're going through they finally get to the promised land they show up it's like having a big house just ready for them they're like this is wonderful and they get to the house and the house is full of people and the people have been in the house for centuries they go what in the world so they send out spies and go, man, see how big the people are? Can they get them off our land, get them a lot? God said that was going to be our land, but yeah, there are people there. And they go there, and almost all the spies come back and say, man, we're, it's, we're toast. It's over. Those people are giants. They're huge. It's not going to work. Give up. And two people, Caleb and Joshua, come back and say, we can do it. God said that's going to be our house. That's going to be our land. Don't worry about that. Well, the community freaks out. The community raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the Israelites murmured. You can translate complained against Moses and Aaron, and the, they're the leaders. They always complain to the leaders. And the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. If only we had perished in the wilderness. Why has Yahweh brought us into this land only to be killed by the sword, that our wives and our children should become plunder? Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? They said, hey, here's what we're going to do. Forget Moses and Aaron. They don't know how to lead. That's their problem. 
Let's appoint brand new leadership and go back to Egypt. At least there we wouldn't be killed. Now, I understand that mindset. I understand the mindset. The problem is in the text is God had said, no, that's going to be your land. That's going to be your house. I will take care of it. They murmured. They complained. When you're used to having Egypt, even though it's Egypt, even though it's a horrible place, that that's the best you've ever got, and you get out of that, the first thing you're going to do is, well, I'm, at least I'll go back to what I had. That's what we do in horrible relationships, toxic environments. A lot of times, if all you're used to getting is muddy water, you'll drink muddy water because you'd rather have that than nothing. And that's what we can do when we're entitled. The Apostle Paul tells the Philippians, he says, do everything, in Greek you can say, without complaining or arguing. Do everything without complaining or grumbling. Can you imagine a church or a people group or a family where no one ever grumbled? He said, Paul says, so that you may be blameless and pure. Listen to that, blameless and pure. That's a moral issue. Children of God without blemish, though you live in a crooked and perverse society, the people around us, in which you shine as lights in the world by holding on to the word of life, that's the gospel, so that on the day of Christ, that is his return, I will have a reason to boast that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, that is, for you Christians at Philippi. It's a demarcation between disciples of Jesus and non-Christians that you don't ever go around, oh man, oh, uh. that's not what we do. That's not what Christians do. Do everything without complaining. Well, no, listen, complainers are always taking the thing for granted. Think about, the, think about the times you've complained. Think about the stuff we took for granted. Think about it for a second. Can you list a few things? And even in your mind, what are some things you complain about? Isn't it true as soon as you start complaining, you're taking things you have, other, all the other things for granted that you do have? That is, you're focusing not on all the things you do have. You're focusing on things you think you don't have or things you deserve or things you're entitled to. So what do you complain about? In life, what are you complaining about? Some of you in this church, I know because I've met you now, some people in this church love to complain. If they're talking to me, they're probably complaining. What they didn't get, what they, didn't, what they wanted that didn't happen, the snow, the weather, church, job, they're ju if they're talking to me, they're probably bickering about something they didn't get. And here they are in alphabetical order at the top. Stand up if you hear your name. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Pat. I won't pull you on the... Pat's not complaining at all. She's just laughing, so I'm giving her a hard time. Aaron's the worst. She's just the worst. What are you complaining about? You know, I hear people sometimes, they'll complain Christmas time. Oh, got to go get all these Christmas gifts. Oh, what in the world are you complaining about? You have money to buy gifts? Do you know how many hundreds of millions of people a day? This is no joke. Hundreds of millions of people on the globe who live on about $5 a day. You have the audacity to complain that you've got to go buy gifts for people. You have money for gifts. You have family to buy gifts for. Oh, I've got to do them laundry. And laundry never stops. I'm sick and th You have laundry? You've got clothes? I've got baskets. You have baskets of clothes? How many people in the world don't have baskets? Got to clamp them toys off the floor again. You have kids? Do you know how many millions of parents would go homeless? They would get rid of everything to get their baby back with their babies in the grave. They would give anything to have toys to clean them off the ground again. And you're bickering because you're clean up toys again? Man, those things hurt. I wish you yelling. I wish you clean up your nonsense. I'm sick and tired of this stuff. You have children? You know how many people are barren and couldn't have kids in the first place? I'm oh, doing the dishes again. You've got dishes? You've got a dishwasher? Where I'm from, we're the dishwasher. We don't have dishes. I was in Moscow, Russia a few years ago. I was helping with this leadership institute, and they have very few clothes all about. They were telling me how Russian society, they've got a few outfits, period. And one day a year, the guy was a missionary, he was working for, he said basically one day a year they save up the money and go to the mall and buy like three new outfits. So the closet, I mean, I felt ridiculous. I came for a week and brought a big fat suitcases, you know, a new outfit for every day. I brought my entire, for them, wardrobe. I mean, that, I mean, I bought it all seat cheap and, you know, I do because I'm a value shopper. But nevertheless, compared to them, they wore the same outfit for five days in a row. And as their pants just got stretchy, every time you know, pants do that, they just tighten the belt, tighten the belt, tighten the belt. What are you complaining about? I mean, gut level, what, what's, what's, what is it? What's the thing that makes you so upset? Right, yeah. Ew. 
What is it? And is it worth all that? Here's the test. Here's the test. I'm, it's a test. My own life too. If you would complain about the same thing to that starving child, if you complain about the same thing to a Jew in Auschwitz, it's probably worth complaining about. If not, what are you grumbling about? I mean, really? I'll say it one more time. I started out with a sermon. I'm telling you, I'm not talking about legitimate stuff when you've been to a victim state. You know, David, my spouse just died. I'm sad about that. I'm protesting. That's part of the grieving process. Yep, yep, yep. You're complaining about that. That's normal part of healing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the rest of us that our default stands together. Oh, man, they took my parking spot. Oh. Can you tell God for one day, I'm so thankful for X, Y, Z. I'm so, today, God, I'm going to thank you every time I can say thank you in my mind or verbally or something. When I thank you, God, I have a job. Thank you. What? I'm serious. Could you do that for one day? How many think you could do it for one, one day you praise God? One person, two people, good. One day. How many people could do it for even one week? If you can do it one day, could you do it six more days? Like, I mean, like a test. Here's your homework. For one week, from Sunday to Sunday, I'm going to do nothing but I'm just going to thank God every time I can think of something for which to be thankful, I'm going to do it. What about a month? Imagine what would happen if week after, that's all a month is. A month is just a bunch of weeks together. A week is just a bunch of days together. You could do it. God, I thank you, I thank you. I'm going to be like the leper who came back. I'm not going to be like the other nine. I go, whatever, shaking my coffee cup at God. Do it. I'm going to be the one who came back and said, weren't there nine other ones? I don't want to be in the group of nine, sisters and brothers. Golly. I don't want Jesus to look at me if he showed him the flesh and go, David? David! One's already here doing the right thing. Could you be thankful? What's wrong? Well, if you could do that, I wonder... Can you go one day without ever saying one complaint? How many of you go one day with no complaint at all? No teenagers raising their hand. Of course not. One thing, a little kid. Thank you, brother. I hear that. Thank you. You're going to hold them to it, right? Can you go one day with no, don't, it just even, it comes out of your mouth. One complaint a day. How many of you commit to trying that one day and see what happens? Some of your brains will explode, but just See what would happen. What, and you know, the week is just a bunch of days put together. I wonder if you could try for one week. No complaints. Even if you're, listen, listen, some of you are complainers, and no one thinks they're a complainer. No one does. Right? No one thinks that. Not, not me. I'm just, I'm just a realist. I'm just being a blessing. I'm just telling how I feel. I'm just, and all complainers feel justified. Well, that's different because he should have known because that's what complainers say because I've dealt with complainers. We've all done it. So, could you go one day, one week, try one month? Could you do this? Could you tell one person a day how thankful you are for who they are or what they've done? One day, when you, every time, I was at Walmart, and I'm, these stories don't mean I always do it right. I'm just saying this other day, I was at Walmart here in town, and, I, and this uh, woman is probably in her 30s, maybe 40s or so. She's kind of bent over like this, and she's, she's working at Walmart, and she's taking stuff out, and she's loading up. She's doing go, go, go. She's bent over. When I see someone bent over, I mean, like, oh, my back hurts. I guess, you know, I feel your pain. She's working hard and fast as she can. I'm thinking she's probably getting paid minimum wage, which is nothing. She probably does this, you know, eight, ten hours a day. There's no telling where their background is. And it's just hard, laborious work. And I thought most people work in a job where it's thankless, right? Most people just don't thank you enough. And so I stopped. I said, ma'am. Ma'am, and she kind of looked over like, uh, like, what's wrong? You know, how they, you know, like someone's talking to me, something they're complaining. And looked over and I said, ma'am, thank you for serving us. And her face, I said, thank you for serving us. Sir. That's hard work. I appreciate your hard work. And she just glowed. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, think, I appreciate just trying to, uh, I said, that's hard work, isn't it? And, oh, yeah, she, her face. You know how much money that cost me to do that? You know how much time it took to do it? David, that's so awkward. Who cares? Don't you like to be thanked? What if you want one day and every single time, every time, how many people at work know how thankful you are for them? How many people at home? Thank you for doing that. Thank you. I'm grateful. Look at my eyeballs. I'm thankful. How weird would that be to be the person at work? How cool weird would that be that you're the Christian who says, man, they're always thanking people. They're always showing gratitude. Everybody likes that person. Everybody likes that person. It's the complainers no one likes. They don't. 
the very people that you don't like end up being you end up being those people because you complain all the time. Man, I can't stand those complaints. Complaining all the time. I didn't get my parking spot this morning. My coffee wasn't hot. Uh oh, I'm one of them. Nope. I'm so thankful I got money. Hey, I was later than I thought. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. So step five. Step five, I would say, is choose to be thankful. Choose to be grateful. Let's pray. We ask Lord Jesus this morning, you would give us the ability to choose it and be thankful, thankful for everything. N uh, sorry, in everything. Not for everything, because we're not thankful for everything. We're thankful for you. We're thankful for all that you've given us, what you do through us. We're thankful for the numerous amount of people around us and activities that serve us and help us and the ways we can help other people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done through us, for saving us, for forgiving us, for waking us up this morning. God, we could go on and on, and we should. Help us have the mindset that's not ever a complainer, a grumbler. A, ugh. Please help us shut our mouths when we're about to complain. Help us open our mouths. We're about to praise you and thank you and thank other people for what they've done through us. And in so doing, we will know we'll be a child of God. To the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And this time of communion...